Welcome to the uh, August meeting of the State Board of Education. Uh, uh, we have, um, of course, some students who have already started school. We have teachers who are in the midst of, uh, and staff are in the middle, midst of getting schools ready and, and their own professional development. And then on Monday, um, tens of thousands of Arkansas students start back to school, um, a bunch of whom for the first time. And so it's an exciting, a uh, few days and I want to thank everyone around the state and at the department who are crucial to m getting um, the school year off to uh, an, a good start. And so uh, I welcome uh, the state board uh, today. Uh, we have, um, uh, we get to do fun stuff early on and recognize uh, some, uh, some amazing, uh, amazing folks who are doing, doing great work. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Snyder, who is going to walk us through our uh, recognitions. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Michelle Snyder. I'm the Science State Supervisor here, as well as the National Presidential Award for Excellence Coordinator. And it is my pleasure to start this school year out by acknowledging some fantastic teachers, STEM teachers in K-12, and some young scientists. So it is my pleasure uh, to, first of all, um, acknowledge two of our Presidential Awards for Excellence teachers. It's one of the highest awards bestowed to K-12 STEM teachers, and uh, these were recently awarded by our president, and they got several um, additional things. You get a $10,000 award, you get to go to Washington, you get to go and tour the White House, and you get a signed certificate by the president. So these two people from Arkansas are very special to us. They're actually the 2016 award winners. So if I may have the pleasure of introducing Justin Leffler. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm Justin Leffler from Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've served our state as a sixth grade science teacher and alternative school teacher. Um, science teaching is important to me because in science class, my students develop and hone skills, knowledge, creativity, and flexibility that give them the confidence that they can add value to existence by their presence. Students gain insights and practice habits of mind that promote their individual and our communal long-term physical and emotional health. My students develop deeper compassion for others and act out of a sense of social responsibility interpersonally in the community and in the greater society in our world. In science class, students develop an awareness of the beauty, complexity, and challenges that surround them, and they explore multiple paths that could lead to their long-term happiness and satisfaction in life. The Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching has given me a chance to step back and look at my career and at education as a whole. Discussing education policy with the National Science Foundation, with Department of Education and representatives from Arkansas's chosen by our governor was an eye-opening experience. And I hope to become a valuable asset to our state's policymakers. I hope to use this recognition as a key to unlock opportunities to collaborate with other innovative, passionate teachers across the country. My role models have shown me how to wield the power to help others, and this award will help me better serve education in our state. This award also gives me the chance to more effectively drive innovation and improvement in education. Thank you for this recognition and the opportunities that it will give me to contribute on a broader scale. Thank you so much. The next awardee is Amy Sandy. So I was asked to talk a little bit about math teaching and that's very dear to my heart, not just because of the mathematics, but because of the opportunities I get every day to teach kids that mistakes are valuable, that our worth as students and a human being is not in our ability to get the correct answer but instead in how to reason through it, how to deal with a mistake and come to class the next day and be ready to try that again. So this was an amazing opportunity. I'm happy to go back to my classroom of 25 little 
eight and nine year olds. I got to see them last night, actually. And they had stars in their eyes. A few of them had heard about the award. And I said, we're going to have a great year. And they were so excited. Yeah. So if nothing else, just to bring that passion for math, that passion for exploration, that understanding that the correct answer is not always the goal. And also to help my fellow teachers understand that professional development never ends. That if it's not something that's easy for you to find, you just have to look a little harder. You just have to find those books, you find those teachers, you get into those classrooms that will help you grow your practice so that when you wake up the next day, you can do better for those kids than you did the day before. So that's my passion. I'm happy to represent Arkansas and I'm extremely honored to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all both for your, your passion and your energy and your creativity and all of those things that, uh, uh, that you showed today and, and show every day. So uh, we're very thrilled that you spent part of, the, part of this day with us. Thank you all. Great, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you two young scientists from Central High School. These two young ladies won the Intel International Science and Engineering Award in May. And so this, they were busy doing science research over the summertime, so they were not able to come any earlier. So it is my pleasure to introduce these two lovely ladies. Megana Bombimpali is 17, and she received one of two Intel Foundation Young Scientist Awards for $50,000. And I'll have her explain to you her research. <laughs> so please let me introduce Megana. I'm a rising senior at Little Rock Central High School, and before I talk about my research that won me these awards, I'd like to briefly talk about how I first got involved with science research. So I was born in India, and I moved to the United States when I was two years old, but I still have a lot of family in India, so every couple years I go back and visit them. And it was on one of these trips that I first got involved with science research. So my grandfather in India is a politician, which means he's always traveling to different parts of the country, visiting different communities, and on this particular trip, I decided to join him. And on this trip, we visited several rural communities that were facing a water crisis. People in these communities had to walk four miles every single morning to get water that wasn't even clean. And after witnessing numerous deaths and illnesses from waterborne diseases, when I came back to Arkansas, I decided to start researching water pollutants and different filtration methods to try and develop some sort of economically feasible filtration device. And once I designed, perfected, and was completely satisfied with them, I mailed these filters back to the communities in India, and upon getting thank you letters back from them, I knew that I had found my passion. Using science research, specifically my science research, to make a difference in a struggling community was exciting for me. So every year, for the past five years, I've conducted science research within the environmental science field. So this year, I decided to focus on clean energy sources and energy storage devices. So if you use a car or some sort of consumer electronic device like a DVD player, then my research applies to you. So supercapacitors are energy storage devices that are used in so many common applications like medical devices, automobiles, and electronics. They're great in terms of their portability and how much charge they can hold. They're better than batteries, and they're much better in storing charge when compared to fuel cells or lithium-ion batteries. But here's where they're not great. In order for a supercapacitor to actually work, it needs an electrode. Right now, the electrodes today are made from platinum, palladium, gold, and diamonds. So these materials tend to be very, very expensive. One ounce of platinum costs $1,000. So imagine how much an entire electrode is going to cost. So now you have thousands of dollars that you're pouring into one part of one device that's going to be used in one application. So to make supercapacitors more applicable, the cost of the electrode needs to be cut. So through my research, I was able to develop an electrode using inexpensive and natural resources like tea powder, molasses, and tannin my electrodes were carbon-based, environmentally friendly, and had 90% of the efficiency rates of platinum. 
They lasted longer than the platinum electrodes, and they were made using a commercial microwave technique. But the best part, the electrode costs less than $1. Now, I want you to think about that. Although platinum is so expensive, supercapacitors are still widely used. Imagine what would happen if you put my less than $1 electrode into a supercapacitor. The applications would be multiplied, and the electrode would no longer be a limiting factor in the applications of supercapacitors. So for my research, I won the 2018 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair and their Intel Foundation Young Scientist Award and their $58,000 award, which was one of the top three awards given at the fair where thousands of students from over 85 countries participated. And I was also named an Amy Polaire Smart Girl, which gave me an incredible platform to share my research with people who have like-minded interests. Um, in the direct feature, I'll be giving a TED Talk at the 2018 TEDx Fayetteville, which is something I'm really excited about. But I would like to thank the State Board of Education, and of course, Ms. Michelle Snyder, and Commissioner Johnny Key for the opportunity to talk about my research here today. Thank you. not done. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to also announce Anusha Bhattacharya. She's 16 years old and she won a scholarship to Arizona State University and the third place award for her research. Please welcome Anusha. As you can tell, I'm a bit nervous. So, my name is Anusha Bharacharya. I am a rising senior as well um, at Little Rock Central High School, and I cannot put em enough emphasis on how honored I am to be able to come up here and talk to all of you guys today. So, um, what exactly got me interested in science fair? Well, as a child, I was taught what global warming and pollution was, and it absolutely terrified me. I imagine having your father tell you um, that maybe in the future you might have to buy a tank of oxygen in order to survive. And this was one of my greatest fears. But then, fast forward a few years later, I was introduced to Science Fair. And this sort of gave me an opportunity to be able to do something about something I truly feared. So, um, this generally started in middle school when I first made a windmill in order to find the best optimal structure for, to have the greatest output of electricity. And more recently in the ninth and 10th grade when I worked at the fuel cell and attempted to make it inexpensive so it can be able to be a, um, replace current non-renewable sources that we use today. And this year when I worked with making an adsorbent, which is a basically a form of filter, and made it inexpensive and environmentally friendly, so that way we can use it to filter um, our drinking water from high priority pollutants that we use today. One main high priority pollutant that we have today is called nitrophenols. In fact, it is very um, common in our drinking water today, and it can cause severe damage to our kidney and liver. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, basically, when I made this adsorbent, it was able to efficiently remove up to 80% of the nitrophenols in drinking water. And on top of that, one gram of this material was under a dollar. So this, um, doing research like this honestly makes me feel as if I'm making a difference in the world today. And I look forward to being able to do this in my future when I choose environmental engineering as my career path. Now, of course, this would not have been possible without certain people, so I'm going to take a little bit of my speech to thank a few people. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Ayan Degosh, who was generous enough to provide his labs at ULR for the last three years. Um, also, I'd like to thank my science teachers at Little Rock Central High School, my principal, Ms. Nancy Rousseau, uh, my parents, who stood by me my, in my entire life. They're over there taking videos of me. <laughs> and, of course, Commissioner Keyes and the entire uh, de um, Arkansas Department of the Education, who not only took the time to honor me here today, but also provides a good education to the students of Arkansas, helped provide free AP exams and ACT exams to high schoolers today, and on top of that, run amazing programs like 
Arkansas Governor's School, which I had the opportunity to be able to participate in this summer. So back to the point, my doing the science fair projects really um, is to help people around the world. And of course, it's a great plus point to be able to get full scholarships to Arizona State University and <laughs> a science fair award at ISEF. But it's all about helping the people. And thank you again for taking the time today to honor me for that. Thank you all, and uh, I really uh, I love the way the, the comments were connected um, in that we really do see um, how science, uh, starting in the earliest grades, really can be this way for students to figure out how they can connect with the rest of the world and change, um, uh, change the world in some important ways, and the ways in which you all have articulated that through uh, your research. Uh, really, uh, really appreciate it. And Michelle, science education in Arkansas has come a long way in the past uh, six years since I've been on the state board. And I really want to thank you for uh, fighting hard for the implementation of the new uh, science standards and a new way of thinking about how we do science in Arkansas. So. Thank you. It's my passion. Thank you. Right, and you guys are welcome to stay or you're welcome to go on with your lives. Uh, it is your choice. But we really appreciate y'all being here uh, this morning. Great, thank you. Awesome. Thank y'all. All right, um, next, um, I did wanna note a couple of changes on our agenda for the day. Um, uh, as I think the state board knows, we are pulling from the consent agenda item five, uh, which is the Mounts case, and so we may see that uh, back in the future. Um, I also want to give a heads up that we, uh, the morning uh, may be, uh, because of um, uh, a potentially short uh, uh, item this morning, an item that appeared to be long, which may have gotten shorter, uh, we may actually move some stuff up from the afternoon, but we'll just kind of continue through our agenda. We do many of those things don't affect outside parties, and, and we, uh, we will uh, move at a, a, go ahead and potentially move some things up uh, from this afternoon, but we won't move anything that, that uh, would involve outside uh, folks. Um, that does bring us down to the consent agenda, and um, I know that um, uh, we do have several uh, folks on the phone uh, from um, items uh, 9 through 13, the Act 1240 uh, uh, progress report, so if folks have specific questions there. Um, I do know that uh, um, Ms. Newton had a question on item 8. I know that um, uh, item 7, I apologize, my, item 7, uh, the Skaggs case, um, and then Ms. Zook had a question on 13. I had a couple of comments on the Act 1240 reports as a group. Okay, eight, four, okay, so seven, eight, 13, and some general reports on the Act 1240 reports. Is there anything else that anybody would like to make a comment on or pull? Okay, then we'll just go down the list and um, start with uh, uh, number seven, um, Ms. Newton. My, my question was, um, she, one of her orders was to complete two trainings and then uh, do a written summary of that and have that into the department by 90 days. I was just wondering if that part of it had been done. Good morning, Simone Black, Department of Education. Um, at this time, she has not submitted the written reflection on those trainings. Okay. <coughs> Are you, are you okay with that? I'm okay Ms. with that now. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Black, I think we still need you for the next item. Sorry. No problem. Ms. Sick. Okay. Uh, on number eight, I know the recommendation is uh, permanent revocation. And I think as a board member, the hard thing I do have to do there is since we can't be provided all of the details, and then like the case last month where the man came back so many years later, and, and I think the, the board's general feeling is that he would probably do a good job. 
but once something's permanently revoked, it, there is no undoing that. There's no unringing the bell. So on, on the recommendations from PLSB when they are recommending permanent revocation, is there any way is there any way that we can get, I know because it's all confidential just for us anyway, is there any way we can get additional information beyond what we were provided like in this case? Okay, um, this case is actually a licensure action, it's not a PLSB action, um, and all of the information that I can discuss with you is public record, so if you give me one second. I'm talking about number eight. Oh, yes, Miss Lyles. Uh, Ms. Lyles was actually court ordered to surrender her license. The, a judge in her criminal case told her she had to give up her license. And um, that she pled to the endangerment of the welfare of a minor. So that is why she's here and not under any other circumstances. Okay, thank you. But in, in, in the future, if you'll say to them, can we give a little more information? Because permanent revocation is like a major deal. Yes, ma'am. Um, unfortunately, we're a little bit limited with the law, so we do have to follow that. But we will not object if it's appropriate in that instance okay. to Thank whatever you. that person suggests. Thank you, and I apologize for no microphone early. It's OK, no problem. <laughs> Any okay. other questions? Anybody else? OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and then we come down to the uh, Act 1240 uh, annual progress reports um, on 13. Um, and do we have anybody from Lincoln on the phone? Yes, Lincoln is on the phone. Great. Could you identify yourself just for the record? Uh, Mary Ann Spears, Great. Thank you. Ms. Hook? Uh, yes, uh, and thank you for phoning in. I read your report and I appreciated the, the information that you provided. Uh, a question that came up uh, not on any particular point that you made, but I was wondering if you are a RISE school and how many of your teachers have been trained uh, to this point. Could she hear me, Kalisha? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me how many of your teachers have been trained, uh, or are you a RISE school, and how many of your teachers have been trained in the science of reading? We, yeah, we, we're, not, we're not getting your question. Trained and fourth and fifth grade as well. Okay, thank you very much. Fourth, fourth through seventh have been at, have come on board this year. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate you jumping in and getting that training done. And I just want to make a general comment. I I, I do think that these uh, we are seeing a stronger um, annual progress report um, um, annual progress reports than. We saw a few months ago, and I want to I want to highlight those. They do vary, though, um, and I don't want to get into specifics. I'm still seeing some real variance in that some of the reports are really talking about the waivers and then the outcomes, but not really connecting the dots between the specific waiver and specific changes. A couple of them did a very good job of that this month, um, but others didn't, and so we are seeing. Um, I think uh, some uh, districts taking this um, m very seriously and doing a very good job. I think they're all taking it seriously. I don't want to uh, diminish that, but doing a better job of really connecting these waivers as in in independent variables to real outcome changes. Others are just talking about here were the waivers, here were the changes in test scores without a real strong connection to the dots. And I just hope that by the, uh, as we continue to work through this, we're really seeing a lot more specificity between uh, between um, the, the waivers and, and outcomes. Uh, and so yes, and on number 12, I noticed that in the report that El Dorado School District gave, they had listed how well they did in 1819, and I think that was just a typo 
but we may want to make sure it's, it's uh, corrected because unless they're predicting how much, but it doesn't say that. It says we have made uh, great progress in the 18-19 school year. So if, I don't know if we can change it if they turn that in or if they have to change it, but I think it would be good for the record to be sure it says the correct school year. Okay. Good catch. All right. Anything else? Anything else on the consent agenda? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item five. So moved. All right, motion by Ms. Zook, second by Dr. Hill. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. All right, and that reminds me that I did not introduce our court reporter and thank her. Uh, Susan uh, Whitson is here today. Uh, Sharon Hill is, uh, is off on, uh, with a family commitment. She'll be back uh, next month, but we appreciate her, uh, her being here. I will try not to mumble like my mom says I do and, uh, and try to be clear with motions and, uh, and everybody will try to use their microphone. So thank you so much for being here. And it is also important to note uh, at the start of this meeting that this will be our last meeting with Ms. Hollis. And um, this is uh, super sad. Uh, I think we knew that she would not be here forever, uh, but we, uh, we, we, we got a good four, 14 months, right? Uh, about, about that 12 14 months um, and I, I just want to personally say how much I have enjoyed working yes. with you how um, how how we've just communicated incredibly well and I appreciate how responsive to absolutely every even picky ticky thing I've asked you to do and so I want to thank you and I know my fellow board members uh, join you and we wish you the absolute best of luck in everything that that comes uh, later so thank you so much Mr. Chairman, can, uh, if she's willing, I'd like for people to know the exciting thing that's coming up with her and what her next steps are. Well, thank you so much, Chair Dr. Barth. Um, it's definitely been a pleasure working with the State Board of Education. I actually will be moving um, in September, starting a second master's for me in international education um, and also teaching upper elementary school students in Madrid, Spain, so I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we will be in touch with the State Board about, about changes um, in the Commissioner's Office and how that, how that affects us on an ongoing basis, so uh, more to come um, on that front. Okay. All right, we are now down to the action agenda, and first up are the 38 units and graduation uh, requirements, and I'll turn things over to uh, Ms. Smith. Stacey Smith, Learning Services. So last month we brought to you the 38 required. Um, we've done a little adjusting to that list by adding the course codes that was um, requested by districts and cleaned up some typos and just some minor errors that were on there. So this is the updated form and we wanted to make sure and bring that back for, to you to see. Also, when we were looking at the newly revised standards for accreditation, um, the question got brought up about graduation requirements and Smart Core. And those had been removed as far as being explicit in standards for accreditation. And in the new ones, it talked about the state board approving graduation credits. So nothing has changed from previous years as far as Smart Core or the 22 required graduation credits. This is the exact same thing that was in standards for accreditation. So we wanted to bring it officially before the state board to see. Um, and get an action for you guys to be able to vote on that. Are there any questions about that? Any questions on this side? Okay. Any questions over here, Ms. Newton? Are the, are the um, allowances for concurrent, concurrent credit in the English still the same? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and the other question was on Algebra um, two, on the uh, Smart Core, the ADE approved fourth math credit, does it have to be higher than Algebra two? Yes. Okay, I just wondered because it didn't say it there, so right. I, I was just curious on that. Um, the other question I had was the only differences that I saw between Smart Core and the minimum was Algebra 2 and the integrated chemistry. Mm -hmm. And that was, so this is minimum graduation, which is what we refer to as core. 
Right. And those are the only differences. Okay. And so, you know, I just kind of wonder if it's worth the, the uh, showing the difference between them if, they, if we only have two courses different. Um, that has been discussion and topic um, for a while since I've been at the department. Um, we've received constant feedback about Smart Core. Um, there's lots of people who even just the terminology of referring to it as Smart Core and Core, we've had some conversations around that. Mm -hmm. um, one of our strategic planning goals for the department is to look at our graduation pathways, and that's something we've been talking to you about. Also with our student success plans in eighth grade and trying to prepare schools to talk about what their students' course pathways are through high school, and we feel like there could be some recommended changes coming to the state board in the future. Um, but for right now, with what we had in Sanders for accreditation, we felt like we needed to leave it the same moving forward. But I'm hoping to bring to you guys um, within the next year or two some maybe some changes there. Okay. And the final question was um, these graduation requirements because I know there's some different course names in in science, and then we've got. Uh, a little bit difference in the uh, financial and the, the uh, civics exam, what year will this, these graduation requirements go? So this is, this is for current students who are entering their high schools, okay? So Smart Core ha has not changed. I mean, when you look at the course titles, um, we have several different equivalent courses um, in our course code management system for like Algebra One and Honors and things like that. So when you talk about U.S. history and American history, we have several courses um, that when they, I'm not explaining this very well. Um, when we brought new courses for social studies and we renamed them, we basically had to say this, this course now counts for the U.S. history course. Okay? I, my, my question was on the science. So, so for this year's seniors, we're, we're, these, these, these requirements are the same and we still take the old okay. whatever. So for science, the new high school science courses became started this year. Right. So for our freshman kids, the chemistry integrated course for Smart Core would be the course. Okay. For kids previous with the Smart Core form in previous years, it was the, what was in standards for accreditation the year they started their right. ninth grade year. Right. So this would be, I guess what I'm trying to say is this would be for this year's ninth graders. Yes, ma'am. Okay. My question is about process. So we, we talked last month that the 38 units are going to come um, probably back to us in uh, uh, um, the winter, maybe February. Uh, do we, will we also kind of bring the, the graduation requirements on an annual basis in a, or, or is that a, a more infrequent? Um, you know, I, th I think that what it would be good practice is to bring them both at the same time, visiting each time here at the 38, here's what the graduation requirements look like, and so that we kind of keep it at the same time, at the same process. Um, you know, it's, this is the first time that we've not had these explicitly stated in standards for accreditation, and so I think in good practice as far as being very clear to our schools and to the state board on what requirements are, we get in this practice of bringing them at the same time. Yeah, uh, okay, um, I think two things. I want you to explain uh, for the public what uh, transition math ready and transition literacy ready are, because I had misunderstood what those were. It was clarified for me, but I think to be sure that the public knows what those courses in fact are. It's not like teaching somebody to read who doesn't know how to read. Th these are rigorous courses. Um, there was actually legislation passed about students who were um, planning to go to college, and yet maybe they did not, were not necessarily demonstrating the skills, showing that they were ready. However, um, so these are students who are making possibly on the ACT um, an 18, a 19, or a 20, kind of at that bubble area. Um, so these were rigorous courses for students in their juniors and senior years to help kind of close that gap. Okay. And, and then back, because we have a lot of students who um, are, uh, have chosen either because of interest or finances or ability that they're probably not going to go to college. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I understand Algebra one and Geometry. I guess they can substitute Bridge to Algebra two for Algebra two. I don't know. But the requiring of pre-calculus I'm not sure that it seems like mathematic applications or statistics would be, I don't know, 
what will we have to do to rethink having pre-calculus one of the four required courses? So pre-calculus is not one of the required four. Oh, I'm sorry, did I so miss So it, it is considered one of the fourth courses, AD approved courses. There are several courses that can be considered a fourth AD approved okay. course okay. that is higher in rigor than Algebra two. Okay. So it is one of the courses, but Got there it. are several that are considered in that level. Um, but there has been um, lots of conversation around what should the re minimum required courses be for math, for smart core, for core. And so that's some of the conversation that we would like to dig into a little bit more. Okay. Um, but, but this has kind of been, the smart core has been the same kind of for the last yeah. few years. Okay. Okay, so if a student took Algebra one and Geometry and then uh, struggled through Bridge to Algebra two, the, the student's plan through the new ESSA and the counselor and everybody, <coughs> they could then recommend a different course than Algebra two or Pre-Calculus? Yeah, the, you currently have students in the state of Arkansas who take Algebra A, Algebra B, Geometry A, Geometry B as their four math courses. Okay. They're not considered smart core graduates meeting the requirements of right. smart core, but they have met the minimum requirements okay. for graduation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So um, follow on that. So st statistics is not in the list of uh, for smart core advanced co uh, math course. It, it would not be the fourth. It, it would be not. considered as an AD approved fourth course. Is that correct, Tommy? Yes. Okay, so it would count as that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Okay. This may be a question for legal. Do, can we approve these two together, or do we need separate motions on? What two? Lori Freno, I think you can approve them together. That would there'd be no problem with that as long as everyone was willing to do that. You know, if there was going to be a different opinion on them, of course you want to do them separately. But I see no reason why you can't do them together. Okay, okay. Just didn't want to mess up. Um, thank you. So we do have uh, two items uh, together: uh, the um, the required list of 38, which we passed last month, but this is with updated course codes and edits, uh, and then the 22 required uh, graduation credit credits. And I am ready with a motion whenever anyone is. I move to approve the 38 required units and the 22 required graduation requirements uh, as presented. Second. All right. Uh, motion by Ms. Chambers, second by Ms. Newton. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, all right. We are now down to uh, our only Act 1240 uh, waiver request of the day, and I will turn things over to Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Kelly McLaughlin, morning. Charter School Office. Uh, today we have one request before you for Little Rock School District, um, Act 1240, as you know, I've told you many times, <laughs> 2015, allows a school district to petition the State Board of Education for all or some of the waivers granted to open enrollment public school um, for students that attend those um, open enrollment public schools charter schools. Uh, we do have representatives of the Little Rock School District here today appearing before you for a petition of their teacher licensure extension. Um, they have their 90 days will expire on October 17th and um, they are requesting the extension to end on October 13th, 2022, according to the original request. Um, you will want to uh, swear the uh, representatives in, we have Dr. Keith McGee, principal, and Superintendent Mike Poor. And just for a matter of uh, procedure, they will have 20 minutes to make their uh, presentation. If there's anyone here for opposition, um, they will also have that amount of time, 20 minutes, and then the district can respond with five extra minutes. And then, of course, the Q&A session. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, so if uh, Dr. McGee and Mr. Poor will please stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Y'all have up to 20 minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Keith McGee, principal of Horace Mann. I want to thank the State Board and Commissioner Key for allowing us to come and make this presentation. 
about this uh, ex teacher extended uh, extension waiver. At Horace Mann, our current mission statement is here. Uh, we believe the staff here believe at Horace Mann that we can create an, an environment that actively engage all students in a rigorous, relevant, and challenging curriculum. Emphasis on science, lab science, let me add, and fine arts, uh, which results in high level of student achievement and student pride. We also believe that we will support this effort through high expectation by working collectively and collaboratively together with the faculty, staff, parents, students, and the community support uh, system to achieve the shared purpose. Uh, our emphasis, again, is more actively engage a rigorous and relevant curriculum. Uh, students at Horace Mann are not a, we do not have a zone, they are have to apply to attend this magnet program, so they have emphasis on lab science or the fine arts. Our content, again, is on the lab science side of the, of the curriculum. We have what we call the STEAM, uh, the science, technology, engineering, and we added the A for arts and for math. Uh, it is a pretty rigorous uh, curriculum that we collaborate with the University of Central Arkansas and Arkansas State University where they come in and provide professional development to our teachers as well as data support to our students to analyze and interpret uh, and it's a two-way communication. Uh, on the fine arts side, students are participating in selected areas which is the visual arts, drama, dance, choir, piano, band, and orchestra. Our lab, lab, our lab science classes are a full year requirement. We do put emphasis on project-based learning. Uh, some, we have some including problem solving and some engineering design processes, not all, but some. Uh, our science fair, not all the kids are able to get that engineering part. So as a result of that, uh, the leadership team, we try our best to do, to enhance our magnum program with fidelity. We take pride in this, and so we do this through research-based profession development. Items such as Kagan, uh, step up to writing, the criteria writing. We add coding for the career technical education piece embedded in the information communication classes. And also, again, several of our partnerships with University of Central Arkansas and Arkansas State. We also have partnerships on our fine arts side to enhance that as well, such as the Thea Foundation with our drama and the Arkansas Symphony with our orchestra program. And one of our several goals that we're trying to do is continue to increase technology in our classrooms and add more community partnership that will be able to enhance our magnet program. So with that being said, we are come here to, to request an extension uh, on the waiver because we had two goals. So let me go ahead and fast forward, come back. Our one goal, and let me amend this slide here, is to increase the student participation in the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Right now, again, only the lab science students were able to get that. By, add, by adding Project Lead the Way to our curriculum, it is open to all of our kids, students, to take this and to enhance this project. Our second goal is to also increase the percentage of students who show growth from sixth and seventh grade. And we started with sixth grade because we want to be able to track the students now that we can have it with, if we're able to grant this request to track this data in ACT Aspire, Aspire, math, science, and again, the STEM component of that, we look at it all. Project Lead the Way will help us with this. Uh, we believe it provides the rigor that we need in the relevant curriculum that we are designed to have and that we like to add. So therefore, let me go back to this slide here. That's the way. As a leadership team, we decided this, we wanted to improve our curriculum by adding Project Lead the Way for all of our students. What we found out, and we wanted to do it in three phases, this year phase one to sixth grade, next year phase two for sixth and seventh, and, and the last third, third phase will be for all grade levels, six through eight. But what we found out that we're running into a problem with all of uh, one particular subgroup and that is the gifted and talented students. The gifted and talented students, because we do have a set curriculum, 
would not be able to take Project Lead the Way because we have a course already outlined. By allowing us to have this waiver, those gifted and talented students now can be able to embed the uh, keyboard into the Project Lead the Way and also add in, uh, PE in the Project Lead the Way by extending the waiver where teachers can collaborate with the Career Technical Education Department to embed those skills and those standards and collaborate with the PE teacher, the physical education teacher, so that they can also enhance that through the project lead the way. That is our goal, and that's why we're here to ask you for permission and to grant us flexibility in scheduling so that we will be able to do away with some of the accreditations in the, the sixth grade, more specifically for the gifted and talented students so that they can be able to have to be able to take in, uh, the project lead the way. We are roughly talking about this year 105 students out of 270 students, or uh, sixth grade. That's the number of students that we're talking about in effect. So if you grant us this waiver again, it is our job and we have embedded our master schedule that where our project lead the way teachers can collaborate with the career technical education teachers and the physical education teachers to make sure that we include the standards. That's all of the slides that I have. Are there any questions? Mr. Poirier, you think? Okay, great. I'll, I'll start over here. Ms. House, any questions? Ms. Fetrich? I'm just not real familiar with Project Lead the Way. Can you just talk a little bit about what that is and how different it is compared to what you're doing now? Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Project Lead the Way is a little bit different. It's a national program uh, that come and where students be able to get the true engineer design model that includes science, technology, and the math component. While we do have the science and we do have, we're increasing and improving our technology, but we don't have that true engineering part that uh, allow us, our students to get. We have some engineering design processes, not all, but Project Lead the Way will allow our kids to be exposed to all of those engineering design processes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Newton? I think this question might be for Mr. Poor or for, for Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, the original waiver that you had, um, the reason you're having the extension applied, what was the original waiver for? Was it high school or I guess, I guess why you had to ask for the extension? Because when we did our research, we found out that the district had the waivers already to allow flexibility in scheduling. So what we need to do is extend that waiver to include Horace Mann, Arts and Science, and Magnet Middle School. So I'm not, I think your question is about the original waivers. Right, that why, why, so I guess why, why the extension, I guess. Okay. I, I believe that, and I appreciate the help from the department, the, we had set up our initial waiver for career ed classes when we came in. Okay. And so this now goes into an academic environment specifically tied to Project Lead the Way course. Okay. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Right. Chambers, anything? Ms. Hook? I'm not ready yet, but I All right. <laughs> Mr. Williams? All right. I, I Dr. Moore? I have a specific question just to get a better understanding. How will physical education be incorporated into what classes and what will that look like? What we designed, what we decided that we'll do if granted permission and we'll allow the uh, project lead the, lead the way teachers collaborate with the P physical edu education teachers to be able to create a lesson one day a week so that we can require to meet those minutes required for the State Department. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, I noticed that uh, overall your school is, you know, a good average school and, and will this be exclusively for those children who are ready or exceeding, or will the students who are close have an opportunity and like shoring up their reading ability or whatever it is that's keeping them from being uh, where we would prefer? It is our intention to, to open it for all students in need of support, close. We want to expose all of them. We believe that if we can expose and motivate our students through this project to uh, lead the way with the technology that it would motivate them to achieve a, lo a lot better. And, and I think in addition to motivation, we have to have somebody who can actually teach them the skills they don't have. So Correct. will that be a part of it or will you do that? Uh, will they have to, parents have to pay for a tutor or how will those kids 
we have a free tutoring, uh, early morning tutoring as well, after school tutoring program that we designed. And we also embed in our curriculum to address those specific needs of those kids individually built inside. For example, uh, we on eight period day, those students would go into a math or a literacy enrichment course to help them. And this project lead the way would be an elective course for them. Thanks, good, thank you. All right. Any additional questions over here? I, my question is, um, is there gonna be, and this really probably goes back to, I cannot remember the, the waiver request from last year. What, what is there in that, what was there in that waiver request in the, in the form of reporting on the impact of the waivers on if I understand your question right, the question, the, the initial waiver we sought was for our career tech programs, mm -hmm. and specifically it allowed us to utilize staff that were trained professionals, had uh, education background um, in terms of taking coursework that fit into a medical field, and that's what we sought was to get a waiver so that those professionals could come in to teach those classes. In terms of it tying directly to an academic performance end, that's probably a little bit more difficult to judge because uh, a lot of those areas aren't necessarily tested areas. But the success of the program, um, specifically for the Excel Career Tech program, the numbers have doubled uh, going into this year, uh, similar to what happened in Bentonville with the Ignite program. So we're on the rise and we have business mm -hmm. partnerships that continue to expand and um, have a Chamber of Commerce right now that also is looking to try to figure out a better way to uh, enhanced scope within those projects so that we can get even more students involved. Yeah, and I actually, I mean, I think those are, are more accurate um, impacts of the program than, than student achievement is, you know, um, kind of um, st students feeling connected to um, a future um, and, um, and obviously increases in the number of students participating in the program. Those are the kinds of things that I think really are where there is a clear connection. And I didn't know what what kind, did y'all have any reporting uh, requirements in that, or was it simply at the end of the of the of the? That was for I five years, right? I believe it was at the end of it was a five year span, five year. and that we needed to provide. But if there is something that we missed on that, then that may be my. No, fault. no, no. It is not required. It is um, some some schools do it, some schools don't. Um, sometimes we get a little we like it when they we do. love it when everybody <laughs> does um, but uh, but anyway I, I just didn't know uh, what requirements I am a little confused so so the I'm, I'm wondering if it actually makes more sense for this to be a four-year request um, since the the previous one would come up for for uh, expiration in a in in, and, and I don't mean to speak for Dr. McGee, years. but I will share that I don't have a problem with amending it to be a four-year request. We had taken the five-year route because if you remember the first time that you all handled waivers, yeah. and, and that was uh, when I was in Bentonville, that we kind of settled on that five-year trajectory mm -hmm. uh, for review. And so we simply were following the previous recipe. Yeah. But in this case, uh, to have it match up with the other Little Rock waiver, I have no problem with amending that to be a four-year review. Okay. okay, I think that would be a little cleaner um, in terms of us just reviewing all of these uh, waivers in, in four years from now. I think that is plenty of time for us to see uh, the impact. Um, so that, uh, I do hear that uh, as, a, as a, an amendment from the floor and it, I think it would, would just make more, more sense. Ms. Uh, yes, uh, is, this, is your plan to like, um, work the kinks out here and then spread it to your other middle schools or uh, is there some reason that that man is is it the leadership that's prompted the request for this school or is it something with regard to the staff or the students at the other schools why it's not in all the middle schools well i'll, I'll start and, and dr mcgee may have a comment beyond that Project Lead the Way is not just isolated in terms of man being the only middle school. So we do have Project Lead the Way at multiple campuses. And, and uh, just for a little reference point for state board members, there are Project Lead the Way all over the state. In, in uh, almost every major district, you're going to have Project Lead the Way, both at the high school and the middle school level. So we have not found that need. Um, this one 
as Dr. McGee, I think, outlined, kind of came as a result of a, a kind of almost a disconnect that we were having within the GT population to try to make this one work. Uh, but uh, it is my assumption, and I could be wrong, that by moving forward on this, that that would allow us, if we run into another problem with a, a school in the Little Rock District, that that would also, the waiver then would cover it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Commissioner, if they ask for a specific school, even though the district gets the waiver for that school, can they use it in others without having to come back to us? But if you would permit me to say something before that. Sure. Uh, for man, now again, let me outline, man has a strict curriculum with the magnet piece. Yes. Which comes with courses already outlined. Yes. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not sure about the other middle schools, but I know for man, they're not, our students are not able to get that elected of their choice. For example, again, a GT on the lab science side, that if given permission, like Project Lead the Way, that gifted and talented student would not be allowed to take Project Lead the Way because the courses for sixth grade is already lined out for them. And the same thing for a sixth grade fine arts student. So uh, for uh, your question, the original question, it was prompted by the leadership team at Horace Mann that we felt like Project Lead the Way would enhance the lab science side, but also provide opportunities for the fine arts students to also take advantage into the two goals that I mentioned earlier to increase because we know that technology is the way now and we know the kids right now, that's the eye there. It motivates them. It's a hand project lead the way it's a hands on. And we believe that it would just enhance what we are doing at Horace Mann. Right. And since you're a magnet and so you have kids that go to all the different high schools when Correct. they leave you, uh, is there a way that we can, or, or that you can, find out uh, the difference between the kids that were involved and, and how that well they did then in ninth on up, or so you can we can track to see, gosh, we want everybody to do this, or no? You That's know. a great question. Uh, however, it, this will be the first year that we're implementing this. Right. So it is our plan to try to track that beginning in the sixth grade this year. Uh, majority of our students go to attend Parkview and Central, uh -huh. uh, with few going to Hall and the other uh, high schools in the Little Rock School District. But majority will go to Parkview and Central, and Parkview has a Project Lead the Way piece at, at their high school level. Yeah, I wonder since you provide transportation, what it is that prompts the students from those high school attendance zones to pick man over the others. It, it just seems like you sort of have a balance between Southwest Hall, Parkview. It's a great you know? question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the answer for yeah, that. Yeah, because sometimes they'll say, well, kids don't go to charge because there's no transportation, but you know, Horace Man has tra uh, transportation, so it's you know, be interesting. We can get somebody to write a doctoral dissertation on that. I'm seeing Ms. Uh, Dr. Boyd Oh, no. uh, she, she just referenced to me that, that her belief would be as advice to me and to you as a board that you would, uh, the current recommendation is just for man and that if we, if, if we wanted to broaden it, we could do that as well, but we need to be intentional about it. Okay. That, that was my, I mean, all of this conversation we've had with Dr. McGee, and we've been talking about this for several weeks now, and, and has identified the the challenge and we kind of got caught up in that transition from the old standards to the new standards. So uh, I want to say I uh, express my appreciation to Dr. Boyd and her team and working with Dr. McGee to come up with this was the uh, agreed upon method of making sure they could do what they wanted to do and get it in process before Monday, um, <laughs> which is uh, we, which we were kind of under the gun. Uh, so it, it be my opinion as Mr. Poor said, that this would be specific for man, but if they, if other middle schools felt like it'd be helpful, that we would want, we would expect to see um, another modification brought to you all. Well, and I know that a lot of times, if if that principal comes and says, "Can we do this?" it's more apt to succeed than if we say, "You're going to do this." And, and Dr. McGee has been very. Uh, determined to find a way to make this work because I, I think they've worked really hard with with his team to identify the challenges that they need to overcome 
and uh, I and just commend him and commend our team at the charter unit for uh, working to come up with this solution and Dr. Pfeffer. Uh, Dr. Pfeffer had a, a, a lot of influence on coming up with a way to think strategically so that uh, we could make this happen. Okay. Any, any additional comments or questions? Okay, so uh, Dr. Boyd? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so what I'm hearing is the the, uh, the request as written uh, with one amendment, which would uh, shift it to a four-year uh, request. Um, all of the items are in the T-shirt licensure uh, category, um, and so I think we can do this with a single motion um, to uh, whether to approve. The, the proper motion is either to approve the waivers or to reject the waivers the waiver request. I move to approve. Second. All right. Motion by Ms. Zook, second by Mr. Chambers. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, thank you. Great, uh, good luck. Um, have a great start to the year, Dr. McGee, and see you soon, Mr. Park. Um, okay, um, I will remind folks on the microphones, if you could get them kind of about here when you're speaking and turn them down, especially some folks weren't here last month, turn them down when uh, you're not speaking so that we don't hear all of the cacophony in the, in the room. But, but point them straight toward you when you are speaking, please. Okay. Um, our next item uh, up is the third round of the ABC 2018-2019 uh, uh, renewal grants. I'll turn it over to Ms. Underwood. Thank you. Susan Underwood with the Division of Early Child Care and Education. I bring to you the third round of the Arkansas Better Chance grants that include an award of an additional 10 slots each to Mammoth Springs School District and Little Rock School District, in addition to the one-time funding startup, a funding of $5,000 for each uh, program. During the June 2018 State Board meeting, the ABC funding was approved for the following uh, programs to increase their preschool services with additional slots. That includes Bradford, Concord, Elkins, Kip Delta Public Charter School, Little Rock, Northeast Arkansas Co-op, OUR Education Co-op, Prairie Grove, and the Southwest Education uh, Co-op. The attached chart in the board um, packet reflects the one-time funding startup of $500 per additional slot. This provides assistance to purchase materials and supplies for the new classrooms. Therefore, a request to approve additional slots to Mammoth Springs and Little Rock School Districts. The total grant amount includes the retro pay in the amount of $48,600 to both Mammoth Springs and Little Rock School Districts for the payment one of July 2018, as well as approval of one-time funding for the listed agencies. This is proposed for your consideration. Okay, I'll start over here. Anyone on this side have uh, any questions? We've obviously seen, seen these uh, regularly. Anybody over here? Ms. Oak? I can, no, you're, right, you're good? No, okay. I was just, you know, when she finished, when she finished, I was gonna have her share with the board what she shared with me earlier, because I had asked her last month if mm -hmm. the ABC run facilities were coordinating with the school districts when the school district wasn't running, and she had great news for me, so I wanted her to share that with the board. Okay. I do have a quick question on these uh, these startup funds. Um, is is how how is what kinds of things does that go to? Well, a lot of times they have to set up a new classroom, or even if it's just ten slots, they're adding it to another ten okay. that they have. So, in order to have those education materials and supplies for the children, and ten thousand is a good start okay. to help them. So this is this is enough new seats to pop to create a a new classroom which has all those, those yes pieces. sir okay great all right I'll entertain a motion uh, on this item so moved motion is to approve uh, these um, uh, these um, renewal grants is there a second 
Second. All right. So, uh, motion by Ms. Zuck, second by uh, Mr. Williamson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed, same sign. Okay. Um, and Ms. Zuck, uh, Ms. Underwood, do you want to make yes. a comment on Ms. I Zuck's question from last night? I took it month? on as a challenge when Ms. Zuck asked about how do programs really work with each other? We have a lot of programs that are private funded programs, and then we have programs that are in the school districts. In a lot of the communities, these programs work together. So when we went back and we were working with the um, ABC coordinators, I asked the question, how are you doing this? I said, I'm sure you're doing it, but how are you doing it? They came up flooded and wanting to tell us. There was one little private program said, in our community, we are the hub of preschool. We work with the elementary. Kindergarten teachers come down and read to our children. We are invited to come to the school to, um, for the children to be involved in some of the events or maybe special guests or uh, community involvement. Then we also had others, even the larger ones, the smaller ones. They said we invite every uh, caregiver in our area to come and do professional development with us. And the thought is these communities, these children are our children whether they go to Miss Susie's little pre-K or they go to the school district grand pre-K. They are our children. So why not have quality inf information and instruction and build the teachers, build the students, and also link that to your kindergarten, your first grade teachers as well. So they are doing it. It may not be as apparent, but they are excited to report that to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for, okay. for doing that. Okay, um, everybody doing okay? Yes. Okay, um, next up we have an issue that I don't know that I've seen before, but uh, it's always something new on the State Board of Education. Another um, early childhood issue with the, an ABC program appeal, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Dedman to walk us through this. Good morning, Jennifer Dedman for the department. Um, we have before us an, an ABC appeal that the board was to hear this morning, but uh, there is no representative from the, the person appealing. Uh, they had a legal representation um, and they did receive notice. The, the department did notify them of this appeal. Although we have not heard from them that they're planning to withdraw their appeal, they did not appear today and the board may consider the appeal abandoned and choose to deny. Okay. All right. And because it, it was on the agenda, I do think we need to deal with it as take action on it in some some way. Um, but uh, do folks uh, have have questions about what we're being asked to vote on today? I, I would add um, that a representative from DHS is here, and they do have documentation to indicate that the program has closed its doors. Okay. All right, Dr. Moore. Yes, Dr. Moore. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So basic story is they appealed, but in between the, the filing of the appeal and today, they voluntarily uh, Yes, closed. Dr. Barth, um, between the time that they requested the appeal and today, uh, DHS has received um, indication, um, and we do have copies of, of a screenshot that indicates that they voluntarily closed their doors. Um, a member representing the party and the party, they are not here today. Um, at your option, you may consider the appeal uh, abandoned and therefore deny. I do have a. It's not a. It's not exactly on this issue, but it's it probably a mis, maybe a, a Miss Underwood question. Um, my question is we, obviously a significant a, a, a number of slots here that were at this uh, facility um, in a in a um, in a community that we know is uh, is challenged in terms of. Uh, uh, can, can I ask yep. Question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Barth. I want to make sure we don't miss something it, because this is a, a, a hearing. Is there a point at which we need to swear anyone in for the purposes of the record? If uh, anyone plans to give testimony, you, you might consider swearing them in. Okay, yes. so questions would not fall under that I, requirement. And, and I can hold my question until after the actual hearing if that would actually be cleaner. So you I know it's a. No, no, you're right. Yes, we're, we're hearing yes, do for the men. Okay, I'm gonna just hold and ask my question after we deal with this, this issue, but I'm curious about something that is relevant but not direct. Okay, everybody clear on where we are on this? 
So the proper motion would, um, first off, we have no one who's not, who's not an attorney here to be a part of the hearing, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. We, so we, we do have a representative from DHS but that is also an attorney. An attorney. But, right. Uh, also an attorney, so we don't need to swear him. Um, so no one to be sworn. Um, so, so the proper, if there are no questions, the proper motion would be to deny the appeal or to, if someone wished, uh, uh, accept the appeal uh, on the basis of paper, not on the basis of any actual testimony today. This is in Southwest, Southwest Little Rock. It's a Southwest Little Rock. Okay. Yes. I thought it was. Yeah. Would the board, did the board wish to consider uh, the documentation DHS has today uh, indicating the program is closed? Do we know how many slots they had and whether or not anyone has worked with? Uh, um, Ms. Ms. Look, that was exactly sorry. my question, okay. and I think we don't want to go there okay. at this moment. But we'll go there right after this. Okay. <laughs> Again, because because no one has appeared and they were notified, they've essentially abandoned their appeal, and the board may therefore deny it. Yes, I am, Ms. Newton. I move to deny the appeal. <coughs> All right. Motion by Ms. Newton. Second by Ms. Uh, Mr. Williamson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay, we've denied that appeal. Now, Ms. Zook and Dr. Barth, um, uh, our question's relevant because I think we have the same concern about uh, the loss of slots in a, in a neighborhood that has major achievement sh gap issues. And so if you could respond to that, that would be helpful. And we anticipated this. So we, um, when we, when we were working on this um, situation, we thought, what are we gonna do with these children? Where, where are the opportunities? And they did have 170 slots. Um, in Southwest um, Little Rock, we have several different programs in that area. We reached out to Little Rock we, um, School District, which have several in those areas. We reached out to Pulaski County School District, and then there's a couple of private programs in that area. Now, um, Little Rock does have more additional slots. Pulaski County had, in those areas, had um, programs that were not being filled, so they were taking those children in, and some of the private programs. They've all reported to me that parents are coming with their children, enrolling the children. We even have some of the teachers from that program that are reaching out to our other ABC programs for employment. So your anticipation is that at the end of the day that, that that most of the, the, the slots will get shifted around to other. Yes, sir, that's other, what we're anticipating. Um, other invitees, okay. Are you, mm -hmm. Is that your, your question? Are there other questions related to this topic now that we've dealt with the appeal? Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Underwood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Dedman. Okay, that's, that's why we expected that to be a much longer item, obviously, and uh, it was a, a, a short item. Um, okay, we uh, are now down to action. Take care. Uh, down to action, uh, agenda B at 1 p.m. We know that we need to hold the school choice uh, issue until all the parties are here, um, but we do can go ahead and deal with the practice uh, uh, English to speakers of other language uh, license, and I will turn it over to, is, 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 is oh, Ms. No. Good morning, Joan Luno, coordinator of Ed Prep here at the ADE. Um, we have two items on the agenda that deal with the new ancillary license areas that were added in April. One of those areas is ESOL, English to Speakers of Other Languages, and the other is Dyslexia. I'll start with the ESOL ancillary license. Um, you really have two pages. You've got the recommendation to use the Praxis test that we're already using, and then there was just a one-pager, just a general explanation of the new areas and what will be required of each of those. For the ESOL ancillary license, this one will require a master's degree or higher. Um, in ESOL or equivalent, and then in addition, because we do have a test approved by the state board, uh, we would like to recommend the use of that test, and it is the English 
to speakers of other languages 5362 we already have an established cut score of 155 and we recommend effective September 1 2018 that we adopt that for this ancillary license as well are there any questions um, on all right Ms. Smith Ms. Smith Petrich anything okay all right Dr. Hill no no questions okay Ms. Hook Dr. Moore. Have you all received any feedback or concerns from teachers on this? No, I have not, to my knowledge. No, we've not in licensure either. All right. And so for new members of the board, this is one of those things that does come regularly when, when tests are altered or cut scores are altered or new tests are created um, um, uh, or new licenses are created. All right, I would entertain a motion to, um, to approve um, this, um, this license and, and cut score. The license has been created. It's the test and the cut score. Yes, sir. All right, motion by Ms. Chambers. Second. Second by Ms. McFetridge. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right. Great. All right, I'll pass. All right, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Smith and Ms. King. Okay, Stacy Smith. Um, so we're very excited to be bringing this to you today as far as recognizing the CALT license or the Certified Academic Language Therapist license um, for an ancillary license. Um, this is not a master's program in the state of Arkansas. However, it is a very, it's nationally recognized, very rigorous um, professional development, you re recognize professional development, practicum, there is a test that you have to sit, by, sit for to be able to get this recognition or this license. And so we were recommending to you and to the Department of Licensure to recognize this as its own ancillary license. We have about 100 teachers in the state who are actually working through um, this practicum piece and working through the training that would actually um, benefit from this. Any questions related to this issue, Ms. Newton? You partially answered my question. You said you had about 100 teachers in the state. Are they located in one area? Are they spread throughout the state? Or Vicki could probably answer something, but yes. Vicki is considered one of these therapists. Go ahead. Congratulations. Hi, Vicki King. Um, I we have had three different co-ops that have hosted. I, let me try it. Four I said this summer that have hosted uh, training in this area. So we had Northeast, uh, Crowley's Ridge Co College. Uh, Curly's Ridge Co-op has hosted sessions three summers in a row. Okay. Um, Northwest, there has been a couple of training sessions up there, and then this year, um, South Central hosted a training. So it's kind of spread out across the state. Are there any, um, at just, you know, the training is so intense and, and great benefit for students. I just wondered if there was any, um, push to, to push that into all the states, all areas of the state. So the training is tied to specific programs or curriculum that teachers are trained through. So there are different programs and curriculums that schools can use for dyslexia wow. training. So this is specific to some specific curriculum products um, as far as getting the actual training. Certain states, like Mississippi, they do have colleges who recognize this for a master's program. SMU in Texas recognizes the training as, so as far as we would have to have a university in our state to be able to take it up to give it a master's program. As far as local districts choosing the curriculum to use and having teachers go through for the training, um, those are kind of local decisions. Um, but we have lots of teachers on their own who didn't go through with a district who chose to get into the training program because they saw the benefit and then can after they get the, the certification they can use a variety of dyslexia programs to instruct with okay. I, I just you know the intensity of it I, I just I can see great benefit so in the original dyslexia legislation when the state kind of in the, the original in which we were talking about different programs to be endorsed or um, at, at a state level, we had legislation changed that changed who w could teach a dyslexia program or who could be the dyslexia interventionist. And so this was kind of at the highest level of rigor for a teacher. This is, this is 
really, yeah. this is what you would want for all, yeah. okay? Um, and so at this point, these teachers who've had this high, tra this training and this license haven't been recognized. And so this is giving them the opportunity to actually get a license for this. And for schools to look at hiring these folks yeah. as their dyslexia Absolutely. therapist. Yeah. So uh, just to get myself clear, um, so we have the, the dyslexia law, of course, requires every um, school to have a dyslexia interventionist for the district, correct? And that could be a paraprofessional all the way to a licensed teacher. Okay. And so um, if they are a licensed teacher, they might or might not have this license. Correct. Right? Okay. If an interventionist in a district does not have this license, does not have this level of training, what level of training will they typically So the have? law requires that they have training in the program in which the district is using. So whichever curriculum program the district chooses to use, they are using that program with fidelity and have training in that program. But there could be a, a fairly large gap in terms of uh, the level of training for the first person who is the go-to on issues of dyslexia um, in a district as a result of, of this. Yeah, and we would want to encourage districts to look for the most, you know, the, the, the teacher who's applying that has the best yeah. training. Well, and that was, that was actually my question. What, what can we do, what are we doing to urge the licensed teachers who are in that role to, to move in this direction, recognizing it is very intensive and, and in a variety of ways. I think today's step is the first step in moving that direction, that we're recognizing it as an analepsy license. Um, we're continuing to work with higher ed programs and establishing programs that are recognized as dyslexia to add to a teacher's license. Mm -hmm. um, the law itself actually recognized that the state needed time to develop these sure. programs when it was originally passed. And so that's, that's what we're in right now. We're mm -hmm. in that piece of continuing to work with higher ed who are establishing programs and recognizing national programs mm -hmm. that meet that rigor. And what, what, is, what is your estimate of the, of in a typical case for, for a, um, a, uh, a licensed teacher, um, what would be the cost of all the activities involved in terms of getting to this stage? I believe currently our co-ops that are arranging for this, it's costing, um, uh, uh, for an individual teacher, I think it's costing about three thousand to thirty-five hundred dollars for the two years, but that includes their materials to get started in the classroom, and that's pretty extensive with this with with the one the primary one that's being used. That's quite a lot of material. And so that that cost could be covered by the district, could be covered by the individual. I mean, there's it's it's a district by district issue. Well, it does you know it does raise that it that that concern, I mean, of um, we know that um, dyslexia is a, there, there are tremendous inequities in terms of how much um, uh, professional um, coverage exists, even with this baseline. And it does raise the question of what we as a state could do uh, to begin to speed that movement of folks into this level of training. So I mean, I may not be answering this question, but I will say the legislation about science of reading and the prescribed the pathways for proficiency for teachers, that is rooted in what these programs um, teach in a very intensive manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as we are providing that professional development statewide in the science of reading and through our RISE academies, mm -hmm. um, we're laying a solid foundation, and that's what we're that's what we're hoping to do. Um, so. I think we are accelerating it in the state, mm -hmm. um, much more than just about dyslexia. What I hope we see is that um, schools start recognizing that um, most of their students should be able to read and read on level mm -hmm. if we're using the right practices in our classroom. And that the students who are receiving intensive dyslexia intervention are really a few, a few in number. All right, when you hear folks talk about the numbers of dyslexia student, you know, one out of five, I, I believe that. Um, but I believe that some of those students are not as severe, they're low sure. in dyslexia, and that their needs would have been met had we properly taught them to read in the general classroom in kindergarten and first grade. And you may never see that those students actually get dyslexia intervention, but that we're providing the right type of instruction early on to be preventative. Mm -hmm. So. 
we want all of our teachers trained in the science of reading mm -hmm. and we are in talks with higher education about making this a priority in their colleges so that teachers who are coming out have this knowledge they now have to pass that standalone reading assessment um, so I think this is much bigger than just the dyslexia conversation today with this license for dyslexia and recognizing this group of teachers who are highly skilled and trained I think is a win for us um, I think it's something for higher education to continue to look at about this is what best practices look like for this area for students with dyslexia um, and so I think this is a first step today. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing Ms. Chambers and then I see Dr. Ola as well. So Ms. Chambers. I was just curious, and this is a, it's a specific question but maybe has a broader response. Do we, in, in, in terms of trying to incentivize uh, these kind of skills, this depth of skill, do we pay for those? Is it left to a district? Is it left to their discretion in terms of paying for these additional acquired skills? So for this right here, you have districts in the state who partnered with their co-ops to send teachers to the training because it was tied to a certain curriculum and the district is paying for it and paying for their teacher to attend. You also, the co-op opened it up to other teachers in the area who wanted to come because those teachers were interested in becoming dyslexia therapists maybe in their district or other districts and they are paying for themselves to attend. So we have a little bit of both. But is there, does their compensation change? So it's one thing to have the cost offset, which is great, but does this result in some additional qualifications that they are compensated for? So at this time, this is not recognized as a master's, okay? Um, but I think as we continue to have conversation, and I think t school districts um, recognizing that their teacher has an additional license could make that choice to give that teacher additional compensation. Oh, and then we'll go follow up on, on that. <coughs> Ms. Chambers, you know, the only certification that we have established as for a statewide uh, bonus or incentive of any type is the National Board uh, certification. Uh, so as far as a systemic boost to compensation, no. It would all be, anything on this would be at the local level. Dr. Owen. Good morning, Jeremy Ola, Educator Effectiveness. Uh, two points that I wanted to highlight. First, uh, Mrs. Chambers, to, um, to provide additional information for your question of concern you just raised. With the Educator Career Continuum, um, with the lead professional and the master professional area, the districts will now have the flexibility to uh, uh, incentivize with a financial um, uh, stipend or, but they have a flexibility. Sorry. But they will now have the flexibility with the Educated Career Continuum to highlight the professionals who have a ma uh, who've mastered certain content areas, as well as um, individuals who may be providing that professional learning within the school or district. And then uh, I just wanted to clarify that we will continue to offer the dyslexia endorsement as well as the ancillary license, so that we could continue to provide uh, pathways uh, to meet the need of uh, of our students who may have dyslexia. And then I'll come over here in this house. Then we'll come over here. Uh, just, just curious. Uh, it seems to me that in a lot of our conversations that we have, as far as moving education forward in Arkansas, Southeast Co-op comes up a lot the things that they're doing, that they're trying to, to um, make available to teachers, professional development, and their cooperation with uh, local colleges and, and uh, offering. I, I just wonder if they might be a good place for us to start talking to about a master's degree in, in this area. We'll look into that. I'm just curious, um, as someone who's going through the RISE training, I have a master's degree in reading, but this aspect of the science of reading was not something I was exposed to until I went through the science of reading training. Is there a pathway to, is that you're building the basis of what you said the, that these folks are going through and getting a lot more <coughs> extensive training in this area. Is there a way for those that have gone through the RISE training to put them on the pathway to continue their learning? Do they correlate? that will so in the prescribed pathways legislation um, this would actually qualify for a teacher to demonstrating the pathway to proficiency um, the rise training is a foundational piece mm -hmm. 
where this actually has the practicum with a student, it actually has, you're sitting for an assessment. Um, so at this point right now with the K2 Rice Academy, we're not there. What we hope to do is we hope to build some micro-credential components with it so that you have demonstration in the classroom where you showed success with your students. And through those micro-credentials and looking at future visions of where we want to be with recognizing teacher skills, that that's something that we might be able to build. Did you enjoy the academy experience so I'm far? Loved, I'm still in it, so I'm loving every bit of it. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, mine is more of a way of clarification. Uh, I've been in this with Vicki from the very beginning, and I think what they're saying is everybody who has uh, is affected by dyslexia doesn't learn to read the same way. So this credential will help you say, okay, well, I'm familiar with the way to teach with, say, Bartons, and I'm way uh, familiar with orthogelling. Uh, you know, there are different programs. So uh, we used to say to parents, if you have seen a child with dyslexia, you've seen a child with dyslexia because they are different. They can be approached different. If you're fortunate, you may have two or three in the group that all learn and can be taught the same way. But these, the people who get this training are going to be, they'll have the science of reading, they'll have the rise, they'll know about Wilson, they'll know about Ortho Gillingham, they'll know about Bartons, they'll know about all of those particular things. Ms. King, for example, went through the program in Texas, am I remembering correctly? I actually got my training. I actually got my initial training here in Little Rock. Right. Um, but then whenever um, the Texas Scotiabank Hospital developed right. their program, I was able to go back there and get additional training. Right, and because she had all that, then when it came time to, to develop and, and uh, write the uh, resource guide for dyslexia, she was more than qualified with input from other people on how to get that done. The, the issue was all of this started in thir the session in 13, and uh, the efforts by Senator Elliott and others were to make sure these students were getting served. The problem was you didn't have people who were prepared to serve them, and they were trying to do it where it was not a um, financial burden, but as you know, in order to get additional training, then it becomes. So it's been a, a work in progress, and Ms. King has been very patient <laughs> in working through all of this and, and uh, working with Ms. Smith and learning services. You know, we've come a long way. In my opinion, we didn't come a long way as fast as it would have been great. Because if you have a child with a learning disability that's in dyslexia area, then, you know, five years have passed now and may or may not have gotten the service they needed. But a lot of the districts are doing a 100% better job than they were a few years ago. Would you? Yeah, okay. But I, th I think just, to, just by way of explanation, this is my field, so I felt comfortable sharing. Ms. Williamson, Dr. Moore. I do think it would be nice um, at some point, I, I guess the question is, would, would it, will this data be, a bit, how, how quickly do you think we're gonna begin to see significant numbers of, of individuals with, with this license? We currently have, um, just since the passing of the dyslexia law and with the four co-ops hosting their sessions and then we've had a couple of other private sessions, we've gone from, I was the only person that was in the state um, that would tr train in an INSLIC accredited program to I think we've got two that have completed their advanced training that could train and we have a third, a fourth one um, a, a person that is working toward that, but, and then we have, I believe last count was 150 that have started, if not completed, and are eligible to sit for that certification exam. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't even know what the numbers from this summer are, mm -hmm. so, that from South Central, but, um, so it's, and then there were people that had received it prior to the passing of the dyslexia legend. So we're probably looking at about 200, mm -hmm. 250, um, and some teachers didn't see an incentive for getting their circuit. We've got several others that have trained in the, done the level of training, but they didn't, there wasn't an incentive to go ahead and certify. So they've got the training, but never finished 
the certification. So I know a lot of people have said, well, if I knew what I know now, back then, I would have gone ahead and certified. So mm -hmm. I, I could see some of them possibly even trying to renew. I think at, at some point, and, and y'all can uh, be a judge of when, it would be great to get a report on the, the districts in the state um, and, um, you know, uh, how, uh, first off, how, how um, um, the degree to which they've abided by the, the, the basic requirement, and I think we probably are hopefully at 100% there, mm -hmm. but then what number of districts have individuals who have this level of certification? Because I, what I'm, you know, concerned about is, um, you know, that student with severe dyslexia who happens to be born in a district where there's not someone who is, is really trained in this way and, and they're really, you know, trapped educationally in a way that somebody who's born a few miles away is not. And, and so I, I'd like to just kind of get some snapshot at the time that you guys think there's enough data to actually be able to, to make that happen. I would like to take a moment to, I mean, all of our co-ops are doing excellent jobs supporting the schools, but we did have two co-ops right off the bat, right from the beginning, that worked with their superintendents of their district, and they had one representative from each school in the co-op area to go through this type of training. That's great. And so, um, you know, that will be, that, that will be, that was um, Southeast and Carlos Ridge. Yeah. So, both of those co-ops. Um, were able to get their superintendents on board, and one may not have been enough for the size of the district, but at least they had a person in their district that went through the training initially um, that could be a resource for them. Great. Okay. Anything else? Okay. We need to, um, therefore, uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve this new uh, ancillary licensure and the um, criteria for um, identifying those who are uh, deserving of the license. Move approval of the ancillary license and the method of approval. Second. All right. Motion by Ms. Newton, second by Ms. Chambers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay. Thank you guys um, very much. Um, thanks for a good conversation about that issue. Uh, we are now down, I'm gonna, I want to get the next two items done if we can before lunch. Uh, we're down to the embedded courses for 2018-2019 and I'll turn it over to Mr. Coy. Good morning, Dr. Barth, members of the State Board. Thomas Coy, Arkansas Department of Education and Learning Services. Uh, for our new members of the board, you, you may have uh, seen us do this before, but uh, if, you've, if you've ever paid attention or watched, uh, watched other board meetings, but we are here to present uh, to, for your approval embedded courses in Act 4. 21 of 2013 allows schools to embed two different content areas into a single course, hence allowing uh, students to earn more than one credit for that course. Uh, we review that to make certain that all of the standards of both courses are met. Um, I wanted to take just a moment on the front end today because you may have seen the list and you may have had some questions, especially around those things like world history and personal finance. Uh, they, they don't really <laughs> seem to go together, and, uh, and there you see a lot of those. Before Mrs. Herrick retired, we were able to review those. We're seeking only a one-year approval for those courses, and it's intended to bridge the gap year because of the legislation that, it, that now requires personal finance to be taken in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. So many of our schools had already had economics in the 9th grade, but because of the way the legislation read, that, that did not meet the requirement. So on these personal finance and world history, as well as the uh, personal finance and U.S. history, we have worked with the districts to come up with a plan where they are teaching those personal finance standards in an isolated time period at the end of the year after they've completed the world history content and the United States history content. So we're only seeking for one year approval to kind of get those students through the gap year and then after that those approvals would go away because we're hoping that districts have made a plan to move economics or personal finance out of the ninth grade year. So they're coming up with a more comprehensive plan for their district. So this helps us bridge that gap year for those students who had already had economics in the ninth grade without layering on an additional uh, course requirement for them. But I'd entertain any questions or, or a motion to approve. Dr. Moore, any questions? And Ms. Williamson? Ms. Hutt. I guess what I don't understand is how you can finish what you need to cover in world history or U.S. history 
and still have time to do this? Are you talking about for the 11th graders? 10th or 11th grade, again, the, the personal finance has to be addressed in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. So we saw lots of different plans. For I'll give you an example of one that I thought was relatively uh, innovative. Uh, one of our schools is using Junior Achievement, and they're using the first Friday of every month. So the first Friday of every month, they're bringing in community partners just to talk to the students about personal finance standards and the requirements of that legislation. So they're taking minimal you know, minimal days. But again, it was a concern uh, about how they cover everything that they need to uh, address in world history and U.S. history. But this was, the, this was the, the plan that we came up with to help get through that gap year. And they couldn't do it over in, with, in a math course? Can you not do cross from sure. one requirement area to another? Sure, and so we, we do have an approval for Algebra two with personal finance. So some of them did it within, within that. Some of them, most of our schools actually made a, made a move, you know, moved economics, or they were using one of our other approved courses as a standalone course. If I vote for this, it'll have to be out of trust for you and Ms. Smith, because I just, I don't, I just don't get it at all. The, and, and I don't want you to think that the, we wrote the combination of these two courses together because that is not the case. Okay, school districts submitted to us that they wanted to teach this course with these standards. Our unit's responsibility then is to talk to that school to determine how are you going to do this, ensuring that all those standards are being met. Um, we've had conversations about is this an ongoing, is this a one year, um, and we felt like that we needed to tell folks this this is for one year that we'll bring it to the state board, but you've got to make the adjustments in your districts if you're going to keep economics in ninth grade, which you're welcome to do. But if you're going to do that, you have to have a plan that's maybe not necessarily this plan. So will this be in the AP too? Because I've got grandchildren that are doing AP but haven't had personal finance yet. It's going to be, that's going to be an individual district decision on how they do that and, and what they're we submitting. Only, we, only had one, we only had one district that submitted with AP, and I believe that was uh, Cabot. And did they get College Board okay on that? That is what we asked Cabot to do. Yeah. And yes, they did. They, they, you know, again, they, they are still using the approved AP U.S. History syllabus. And they didn't want to do it in a math class. <laughs> That's all my questions. I share the I share the concerns of my colleague. I actu actually have more concern with the math class than the world history because I know the the content of algebra two how it's a struggle to to get mm -hmm. just that in, and then to add the personal finance with it. You know, I, I know it, there would be some correlation, but still, you know, I, I you know I I I guess I'm asking is that one also one year? Yes. Okay. Because you know, I understand the struggle also that school districts are under trying to get the personal finance in for these students before they graduate. I, I understand that. And I, I appreciate this for, for trying to fill in the gap. But uh, past one year, I just don't see that, that we can keep doing this. Yes. I, and if I misspoke, I apologize. Everything with personal finance on this list is only, we're only okay. asking for one year approval. Right. But the, the others are, are, are permanent? At least until we bring standards. Okay. English and oral communication when we revise those standards, schools will have to resubmit and align okay. those standards. Thanks. And with each, you talked with each of the separate districts about their plan, or did you, one or two of them you talked to and then the others requested, and so you said, okay, there. No, we talked to every district, and we, and we asked them to include a specific statement that they understood that, this, that we were only seeking one year approval and that this would be a, a larger discussion that they would need to have in their district as to how to move economics and, or how to address the personal finance through one of our other approved courses. Commissioner. In all of these districts, did they have ninth graders that had already taken personal finance? Yes. Okay. Oh, I had already taken no, economics. economics. Or economics. Right. They taken the economics. economics course, right. which included most of the personal finance standards, but then when we revised those standards, there were additional requirements within economics. But all, that, of, all that of these was, districts had ninth graders. And that was the Cabot issue, and it was affecting those kids that were going to take 
six or seven AP courses and they were having trouble. I wasn't aware that all of the districts uh, on the list, but the common factor though is the ninth graders had already taken economics. Yes, and, that, and that's that, why this is a one year bridge. Correct, that, and that's commonplace. Most of, our, most of our schools offer economics and civics mm -hmm. as, a, as a block half unit each semester in the ninth grade year. So they're having to make some, you know, we had some that are just saying that this year we'll have these kids that come up and I know, for example, one of our districts in Western Arkansas is, make, is going to ask everyone to either take the personal finance course through career and technical ed or the quantitative literacy course, which is also approved. Mm -hmm. But that's proving problematic as well. We're getting phone calls because those students then have to give up an elective uh, in their junior or senior year. And so, um, you know, trying to trying to balance this in the best way and, and make sure that districts are making broader decisions about how they how they schedule these courses in the future is we're just trying to get them through this one year. So if we don't approve it, what will they do? Then all the students would have to take an additional course in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade and possibly give up, like I said, one of their electives. But you know, one of the biggest complaints that I hear as a parent and as a past school board member is our children graduate from school without those personal finance skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. constantly. And, and that's a real concern that I have. Yes, and, and that, that's why I don't think anyone would, would argue that the legislation was really good, that we're actually asking students to engage in this. I know, Ms. Newton, you were very favorable mm -hmm. at uh, some previous board uh, you know, I guess after the, some of the student uh, feedback that you got that our yeah. students are getting this. Uh, the timeline was what is what has proved to be a little bit difficult because it started immediately and then it had to be in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, those students who are already scheduled in economics in ninth grade will either have to do something like this or take another course in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. Could it combine with an elective? It could. It could. I mean, they, but that would have to be a that would still be would have embedded, to get an embedded course uh, approval. Well, I know, but what I'm saying is, instead of taking a required course like world history and U.S. history, could they combine it with one of the electives? Uh, for example, I had a conversation with two of my grandchildren yesterday, and one of them just graduated, and the other one's going into the 10th. And I said, do you know you'll have to have personal finance? And the one who just graduated said, do they teach you, like, filing taxes and stuff like that? And I said, yes. And he said, can I go back and audit it? <laughs> and I said, no, but you could talk to your parents and <laughs> they might help you with this. But that, so I think the kids are excited about it, but I just don't know. So <laughs> the, the problem with saying they can do it in their electives is these schools right now are trying to ensure that all their students in a specific grade are meeting the graduation requirement. Right. So when they know all of their students have to take world history and be in that course. And so right now that's how they're meeting the requirement needs for this group of kids. Um, you know, earlier when we talked about the 22 and the 38 and, you know, courses that are specifically mentioned in legislation, um, as we work on those pathways and we start really examining what are the courses that we say are important for all of our students to take. Um, I mean, you saw the excitement on the 38 when we remove journalism as a have to for schools to offer. So as we go into that conversation about what really as, as a state board do we believe are the 22 requirements for kids and if we want to say personal finances, I mean th those are conversations I think that, that we can move to. For these school districts asking for this embedded, they're trying to ensure that they have a course for their students that are teaching the required standards. The curriculum instruction unit has worked with those districts to ensure that standards that are for world history and for personal finance are both being taught um, and that the schools have a plan for that. So, so I, I get that I think an elective probably would be a better place. I think they're just trying to ensure that all of their kids when they graduate have it. Yeah, because I, I can even think of some career ed courses that it might embed better with. And I can see why they have that concern for their seniors, but you know, they're sophomores and juniors, you know, they've got a little little bit of time in there. I just... Well, and I think that, you know, it's just a message that's sent about the value of, of history courses. And, you know, it's it's sending us, it's sending us, and algebra too. Uh, I mean, they're pretty darn important courses. <laughs> they're, uh, I put them with an asterisk on the, uh, on the, on the required list. And, and uh, so anyway, it's, that's the, I think the, the, the deep, con deep concern. 
Um, any Ms. House? Okay. Um, I do have a question on the, so there is one, the, the Career Ready 101 and Personal Finance are linked together. Is that a one year or is that a? That, that is also a one year. Uh, okay. So uh, everything with personal finance is, is a one year. Now, so, Ms. Lucius at Green County Tech has asked to reserve the right to come back if it works. Again, they, they're requiring all of their seniors to do the Career Ready 101 online, so they're actually getting the digital component and the personal finance right. all in one. But I, I told her we would only approve it, we would only seek approval for one year, and then she could come back and request um, again next year if it was successful. Okay. Well, I'm going to use my prerogative and, and split these questions um, into the, the one-year approvals related to personal finance and then the multi-year approvals related to uh, others. Is that appropriate? Well, let me clarify. We bring these to you every single year for approval, even the ones that are multi-year. Okay. They'll all come back to you again next year. We okay. create a list and bring them. Is that, not, is that correct? Oh, then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Can we delete that? <laughs> You we, can start the question, I believe, but let me check with Mr. Yeah. Coy. We, we, we used to do that, and when we first started, when we first started embedded courses, we would bring you an entire right. list every single year, and then uh, at you know, a lot of requests, focus our energies on uh, a lot of schools didn't want to have to resubmit that uh, everything that they had to submit to us for that approval each year. So I believe we came to an agreement that we would only bring it when the standards changed. So. For, example, oral common English, when we revise those standards, we will ask schools to resubmit their entire approval at that point. Okay. Is that all right with everybody? Split those? I mean, maybe the same vote, but I, I'm sending, s sensing a slightly different energy on the, on the two. So uh, I'll first entertain a motion on the, uh, the, the, the multi-year approvals uh, for um, um, including issues like English, oral communications, uh, et cetera. All right. Motion by Ms. Chambers, second by Dr. Hill. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay. And then I would entertain a motion on the personal finance, the one year approvals on, on personal finance. Related, including embedding personal finance in other courses. So moved. Second. All right. Motion by Mr. Williamson, uh, second by Ms. Newton. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Same sign. No. Thank you, Miss Sook. Um, so uh, one, uh, one, one nay there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. And finally, this morning, um, Dr. Oa. Uh, this is item five. This is uh, the content knowledge of adding journalism to a license. Yes, sir. Good morning again, Jeremy Oa, Educator Effectiveness. In July, we were informed from uh, the Praxis from ETS that the Praxis assessment for journalism will be discontinued after August. And so the team um, met and uh, the team here in the licensure unit uh, met and in accordance to our newly uh, approved licensure rules, we would like to request uh, your approval for alternative method of demonstrating uh, content knowledge uh, by the use, with the use of an approval code and coursework with a minimum grade as the method of assessing content knowledge for adding journalism to a license. Uh, we currently have three programs uh, in the state, so we thought it was important to move quickly and have a method for providing uh, that alternative uh, opportunity, so method of demonstration. Okay, any questions on this issue? Ms. Newton. The, the courseworks are through local universities or? Yes, uh, we currently have uh, three programs, uh, Arkansas State University, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, and University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Okay, and then what would the minimum grade be? A C. Okay. Does this, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Does this affect those who already have the journalism license or this is just teachers in the future that are seeking that? It's just the ones that's currently uh, within the program of study. Uh, we are currently uh, pursuing or uh, looking for uh, an, another assessment uh, for journalism, but currently uh, that's in the process. And so we want to make sure that we are prepared to address the current students who are in the program. Okay. So we should expect, or there's a likelihood we'll, we'll be back to revisit this issue when a 
an exam is identified that's appropriate, right? That's correct, yes, okay. sir. Uh, further questions? I'll entertain a motion to approve this all, uh, new, um, uh, new assessment mechanism. So moved. All right. Motion by Ms. Sook, uh, second by Ms. McFetridge. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right, great. Good work Thank this you. morning. Um, lunch is, it's 11.58. We did a lot of good work. So we will pick back up with the first item on the afternoon agenda, and then we'll go to the rules after lunch. So we should be able to be finished uh, fairly early this afternoon.